Hello, and thank you for joining me for yet another in the Gray Learning webinar series of presentations. I'm very excited actually about today's presentation, Lessons Learned Around the World with Just One Lens. Very, very exciting. It was an exciting trip, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation and those lessons that I did learn. But first, I did mention today's presentation is sponsored by Tamron. I want to thank Tamron once again for making the Gray Learning webinar series possible. I always have a lot of fun giving these presentations. I get lots of great feedback, which of course I appreciate, and I hope you enjoy today's presentation especially. So of course, many of you already know who I am. So I'm Tim Gray, in case you weren't sure whose webinar you were tuned into. into. And I know that you already know that I love photography, of course. I'm very passionate about photography. And I also love traveling to see new places. Oftentimes, if people ask where I want to go, my answer is everywhere. I'd like to see every place that I possibly can. Everything has something to offer. Every place has something unique to offer. And so I really enjoy seeing as many different places as I possibly can. I also love to eat. So when I'm traveling, for example, I will often sample whatever looks interesting on the local menu. And I enjoy having fun as well. So along the way, trying to just relax, enjoy, get good food, see interesting places, and hopefully capture wonderful photos along the way. And then speaking of sharing photos along the way, I share my photos mostly via Instagram. I know many of you already follow me on Instagram. If you don't already, I would certainly love to have you as a follower and as a photographer who likes my photos that I share on Instagram. Most of the time, photos that are captured during my various travels. And so in many cases, my Instagram feed actually sort of mirrors my current location, sometimes with a little bit of a lag, depending on what's going on. But you can find me as Tim Gray Photo on Instagram, or if you just want to check out the photos, if you're not an Instagram user, you can point your web browser to instagram.com slash Tim Gray Photo. So let's get started talking about those lessons that I learned traveling around the world with just one lens. First of all, about the trip itself. So what actually caused me to have an around the world journey? Well, it started off with a flight from my current home in New York City to my original home in Los Angeles, California. And so started off with a flight, but then what got me around the world was actually teaching on board a cruise ship. So from Los Angeles, we boarded the ship and traveled around most of the world via ship. So this was actually 84 days that I spent at sea teaching on board the ship. In the process, as part of that journey, we passed through three different oceans, the Pacific, the Indian, and the Atlantic. We visited four different continents and I had a great time along the way. So from Los Angeles to Monaco, the long way around essentially. And then at the end of that journey, once we disembarked from the ship, it was a quick flight to Sweden and then a return flight to New York City, which in the process of course means that we traveled all the way around the planet, including crossing the equator and all of it with just a single lens. And during that journey, by the way, there was no interruption in the Ask Tim Gray emails. I did have internet access the entire time and was able to keep up with the Ask Tim Gray email newsletter and publishing videos in the Gray Learning Library, et cetera. If you're not already getting the daily question and answer emails, by the way, you can just point your web browser at timgray.me slash email and sign up for the Ask Tim Gray. If there's a daily option, that's just the Ask Tim Gray email newsletter. You can also get the weekly option if you prefer. So then the question is, of course, why would I only take a single lens on a journey around the world? Well, most of it, quite frankly, was just a matter of traveling light. I wanted to be more nimble. I didn't want to lug around a lot of gear. The involvement of you know, the cruise gives me an opportunity to see a variety of places, but it also means that any given place we're only visiting for a relatively short amount of time. And so I don't want to be weighed down with a lot of gear on that type of a trip. And so I opted for a very small slimline backpack. This happens to be the Low Pro Pro Tactic BP350AW. You can get more info about it at timgray.me slash BP as in backpack 350, 350. And it's a very small bag. And as you can see in this second video clip, it's got quick access to the camera. And by virtue of having just one lens on this entire trip, 
I was able to work very easily out of this backpack, essentially just taking the camera in or out. It made it almost like it was a point and shoot camera in a lot of ways in terms of not switching lenses. Of course, having decided that I would make this trip with a single lens, then I needed to decide which lens it was going to be. And of course, that involves a rather significant decision-making process, in part because I didn't want to regret missing out on anything. Of course, when I told people initially that I was going to make a trip around the world with just a single lens, they often assumed that I meant maybe like a 50 millimeter lens or something like that, just a single focal length. But I still wanted to have flexibility. And so I actually took some time. I went through my library in Lightroom Classic and reviewed all my photos and which lenses I tended to use most and which focal length ranges I tended to make use of the most. And then I decided on a lens based on that, based on my past history, based on the focal length range I thought I would want to have. And automatically by virtue of choosing a single lens, it also meant that it would probably be a reasonably lightweight lens, at least compared to traveling with multiple different lenses to cover a similar range of focal lengths. So as it turned out, the lens that I decided that I would make use of was the Tamron 18 to 400 millimeters. So this obviously covers a considerable range, a tremendous range of focal lengths, all the way from 18 millimeters at the short end to 400 millimeters at the long end. Now, this lens is designed for APS-C sensors, so for the smaller sensor size. I happen to be using this on a camera. My primary camera is one that has an APS-C sensor. And so with this lens, the effective focal length range is 29 millimeters, actually I think it's 28.8 to 640. Now this lens does work on both Nikon and Canon, for example, Nikon with a 1.5X factor, Canon with a 1.6X factor. I'm using a Canon camera, and so that was a 1.6X cropping factor, if you will. So that effective focal length in terms of the format that I was using would be 29 to 640 millimeters, which obviously is an outrageous range, a wonderful range to have available. It's also a relatively lightweight package, so it's only 1.6 pounds. So to be able to have a single lens that is relatively lightweight and that covers such a range of focal lengths really was very helpful. It made the decision, frankly, quite easy. And the lens does include vibration control, which can certainly be helpful in a variety of situations. I'll talk about just such a situation a little bit later. And the focal, uh, the range rather of the f-stops, wide open, depending on the focal length, anywhere from 3.5 to 6.3, and stopped all the way down anywhere from f22 to f40. So again, depending on the focal length that you're actually set to. So that was the lens that I chose as my single lens for the entire journey. And then there were lessons learned along the way. One of the first lessons, of course, well, not first lessons, but one of the lessons that I did learn is that climbing on sand dunes is not easy. It's actually quite difficult, uh, but fun. And so that was an experience I had a little bit later in the trip. But one of the early lessons I learned was that tracking celestial events can be really helpful. Now, I know that I talk a lot about planning in fact, I created a video course recently on the Photographer's Ephemeris that's aimed at helping you plan for photos that involve the sun or the moon. But in this case, I actually had not planned way in advance. In fact, I was completely surprised when about a week before the event was going to occur, I learned that there was going to be a total lunar eclipse. And it just so happened that the eclipse, that total lunar eclipse would occur when the ship was stopped for an overnight stop in Honolulu, Hawaii, and the lunar eclipse would be visible there. And so a bit after sunset, I think it was a couple hours after sunset when the moon rose, I was actually able to photograph the total lunar eclipse. I'll talk a little bit more about that shot and what was involved in it a little bit later, but I was fortunate that I was able to experience it, especially because I didn't really have a clue that it was going to happen. And so since then, I've been trying to pay a little bit more attention when I'm going to be traveling, what sort of celestial events might be happening during that time. As I mentioned, this was most of this trip was on a cruise ship. And as I'm sure you're familiar, on cruise ships, you have a variety of tours that are often available. But one of the things that I realized is that it can be better in terms of flexibility to explore independently. 
And so, for example, for a stop in Lahaina in Hawaii, there was not an excursion from the ship that included whale watching, but we were able to coordinate and get a local guide to take us out for a whale watching adventure, which was great fun and led to some good photos, some photos that I'm very happy with. Obviously, mostly documenting the experience of seeing these beautiful creatures. And then, of course, exploring around on foot afterward, including a beautiful sunset, some nice sky conditions that we got at sunset. And so I found that more often than not, in, on several occasions, for example, during this trip in various different countries, we would rent a car and go off exploring on our own so that we were able to go find the vantage points, the photographic opportunities, and the experiences that we wanted, as opposed to just taking advantage of what's immediately around the port or the tours that happen to be available from the cruise line. Another interesting thing that I discovered and was maybe just a little bit surprised at was just how many opportunities, how many photo opportunities are available even when you're not in port, when you're out at sea. So just from the ship itself. Now, of course, that means mostly aquatic themed photos. So here a sailboat after sunset near Barcelona in Spain and the early sunrise just off of Kangaroo Island in Australia, a beautiful sunset or the color resulting from sunset in any event out at sea somewhere in the middle of the ocean, and even just you know photographing the water straight down below here on a little bit of a windy morning with the waves getting a little bit choppy, beautiful color from sunrise, and a little bit of a long exposure to get a little bit of an energetic shot essentially of just the water doing motion blurs, so panning across the water at a little bit of an angle here with a slightly long exposure, and even just looking down at the bow wave as you know the whitewash essentially crashes against the otherwise you know just dark ocean on the ship, just from the ship itself, even out in the middle of nowhere, there were often many great photo opportunities. But of course, there were a variety of destinations that we were able to see along the way as well, which is part of the great fun, of course, of traveling by cruise ship. But I also learned an important lesson. One of the stops, of course, at each of these stops, you know in advance where you're going to be stopping, and so you can do a little bit of research in advance, but sometimes you need input from others. So in this case, needing to listen to other photographers, because we were going to be making a stop in Luteritz in Namibia, and from a really quick look online, a little bit of searching online, it seemed like it was one of these stops that was essentially just a port stop, that there was a town there and not anything especially interesting, sort of just a town. And I knew that there was a ghost town nearby and a friend on the ship actually asked if I was gonna be going to the ghost town and I was a little nonchalant. I said, you know, maybe I wasn't sure we hadn't figured out our plans yet and she looked at me like I was completely crazy and said, you have to go, and showed me a picture, actually. Well, it turns out that the picture, the destination she was talking about, this ghost town, I actually was familiar visually with this place. But I thought that it was maybe in the desert southwest of the United States. I had no idea where it was. Well, it's Coleman's Cop in Namibia, which is a ghost town. So it had been discovered, diamonds had been discovered essentially in the sand in 1908. A settlement began, and before long they essentially started running out of diamonds at least those that you could get up on the surface and there were, apparently was another area somewhere else that had diamonds readily available and so the town was abandoned in about 1956 and the buildings are still there and the sand dunes are still there and the winds still blow and so the sand goes into all of these structures mostly houses but a few other structures as well obviously and it's just fascinating I was so glad that I listened to that other photographer and went and explored many of these buildings that you can walk into, sand dunes sometimes going all the way up nearly to the ceiling, up to door jams, and just layers and the light coming in. It was just absolutely incredible. Um, here, for example, looking down the hallway of a hospital with light coming in from the doors on either side of the hallway and sand, of course, littered throughout. It was just absolutely incredible. Uh, this one of my favorite shots from the day with sand essentially half burying this house so that the door now is just locked in place by that sand dunes. Just absolutely remarkable 
So thank goodness I listened to that other photographer, got some input from somebody else about which sorts of destinations I might want to focus on in terms of my photography. Now, along the way, of course, I'm busy teaching on the ship during the sea days. I'm busy exploring different ports during the port days and trying to keep up with my workflow along the way. And I found that workflow on the go can be a bit of a challenge. Now, okay, granted, sitting on a balcony on a ship at sea with your laptop, that part isn't that difficult. But I did find that I was having trouble keeping up with the review of my photos. I'm sure you've had this on trips of your own where you know, you're on day three and you still haven't reviewed the photos from day one. But the bigger problem is that I found that I would lose track of which photos I had reviewed versus which photos I had not yet reviewed. And so I started trying to figure out what approach would work in terms of making sure that I reviewed all the photos. I contemplated changing yet again my star rating system to maybe having a one star rating be assigned automatically when I import my photos and then I would upgrade from there. So one star would essentially just mean that the photo had been imported and I could remove the star to a zero star if I had reviewed the image and decided it was not a keeper. But that seemed like it was gonna be confusing because I was getting a little confused just thinking about it. And then I came up with the notion, which I know some of you have heard me talk about previously, of using a color label to identify photos that have not yet been reviewed. So once I've reviewed a set of photos, I remove the red color label. During the process of review, of course, I identify my favorites based on star ratings. And so I set up a new preset, an import preset, a metadata preset that includes a red color label. So I would use my import preset that included in part a metadata preset that would be applied during import. And that includes my copyright information and contact information, et cetera. But more importantly, in terms of this revised workflow, it included assigning a red color label to every single photo that I imported. Because when I'm importing my photos, obviously, those images have not yet been reviewed. And then when I did have time to review a batch of photos, I would assign star ratings to identify my favorites. And then I would remove the red color label once I had finished a batch of photos. And that meant that when I needed to review photos, I could simply use a filter in Lightroom to filter my images based on those that have a red color label. So any images that have a red color label need to be reviewed. And then when I finished reviewing all of my photos, of course, there would be no photos that match the filter. In other words, no photos that have a red color label. So I found that to be con really incredibly helpful and convenient as a method of improving my workflow. And it's something that I continue using to this day even if I think I'm going to review all of my photos somewhat in real time, I still like to have that red color label so that if I get interrupted for any reason, I always know which photos have been reviewed versus not. Now, of course, you can see from the map that we visited a variety of different locations around the globe as part of this trip. And in some cases, those locations, those destinations would include the opportunity to potentially see wildlife. It turns out the wildlife can be rather elusive. This was one of the challenges that I learned, one of the lessons that I learned. And so I realized that I needed once again to get some input from locals, try to get some help from somebody in the know who could tell me where best to see particular wildlife. And so for example, when we got to the aptly named Kangaroo Island in Australia, hoping to see kangaroos in the wild, when we picked up our rental car, I asked for advice on where should we go to try to make sure that we can definitely see kangaroos. And the person was very helpful and told us of a place that you could go where you were virtually guaranteed to see those kangaroos. It was not a very well-traveled area and it was still mostly rural. It was just a dirt and gravel road that we were driving on in this area. And sure enough, we were able to see kangaroos initially just kangaroos hopping away <laughs> and then of course finding some that were a little more calm and would let us get a little bit closer close enough anyway to capture some photographs of course i guess a side lesson there is that when you have a long focal length lens at your disposal suddenly photographing wildlife gets a little bit easier so we did find plenty of kangaroos on kangaroo island uh, interesting we did see sea lions as well and we were fortunate enough to find a wallaby that seemed to be about as curious about me as I was about it. So we were able to get reasonably close to get photos. And then we wanted to try to make sure that we would see koalas. And there was a park 
all the way at the other end of the island that was known for having lots of koalas. So we park in the parking lot and go into the visitor center and ask one of the rangers there, what are the chances that we're actually going to see koala? And I was told that it was guaranteed. We absolutely would see koalas, that we could probably find them in the parking lot, we could probably find them if we went around on a trail, and that if we couldn't spot any, to go back inside and they would take us out and show us because it just meant that essentially our eyes weren't good enough to spot these koalas. And it did turn out that we were able to see koalas. They were a little bit elusive, especially because they tended to stay very high up in the trees. And it turns out they do a lot of sleeping. So they're not especially active. They essentially just look like a bump on a log. And so you've really got to be watchful if you want to catch a glimpse of a koala. And so we were actually able to spot several of them. We got better and better over time as we were walking along a trail at spotting these koalas way up in the tops of the trees, which was a lot of fun. And then other interesting animals as well. Sometimes, you know, those wild animals weren't exactly wild anymore. Uh, so for example, in Madagascar, we saw a variety of chameleons that the locals had caught as pets essentially, and they would mostly show them off hoping that you would take pictures and give them some money for it. Uh, but the wild animals that were truly wild were to me a little bit more interesting including being able to see lemurs in Madagascar, which was a really wonderful experience. Challenging to photograph. These animals do move rather quickly, bouncing around, jumping from branch to branch. And so they proved to be a little bit more challenging to get photographs of, but really great fun to see. And we did have some stops in South Africa, a, couple, a few stops in Africa in general, but in South Africa in particular, we were able to see some wildlife, so kudu, which weren't the most cooperative animals when it came to getting photographs. Uh, we also were able to see elephants, not that many, a handful of elephants in a reserve in South Africa, uh, but we were able to photograph them and to see them. And then a little bit of a surprise also in South Africa, seeing an ostrich, a group of ostriches actually. And also I didn't realize ahead of time, but learned thanks to doing a little bit of research that there were also penguins to be found in South Africa on one of the beaches there. And so while elusive they can be, the various forms of wildlife, we were able to see a variety of different species and it was great fun to be able to see them in the wild and photograph them as well. Now, I mentioned that I was traveling very light on this trip. So light, in fact, that I made a big decision. And that was not only just taking one lens with a small backpack, but actually not bringing a tripod. As it turned out, I did not miss my tripod. Well, at least not much. And part of the reason for that, of course, is that with the schedule of a cruise ship, you're typically not going to have very many opportunities for night photography. Most of your photography is going to be during the day because most of your time in port is going to be during the day. As a general rule, we would typically arrive in port at somewhere around 8 o'clock in the morning, and we would set sail again somewhere around 6 o'clock or so in the evening. A handful of locations, we actually did have an overnight, and so there were some potential opportunities for night photography. And I had to make a decision. Do I take the tripod, lug it around just so that I'll have it for those handful of opportunities, or do I keep to that notion of traveling light leave the tripod behind and make the most of available light and try to make sure, you know, especially with the vibration control on the lens that I was using, that would certainly help out. And I was mostly going to be out during daylight conditions anyway, so it wouldn't be too much difficulty to skip that tripod altogether. Of course, that also means I missed out on a trip like this. One of the things about a cruise is that very often in terms of the ports, you're not going to be there for sunrise and you're not going to be there for sunset and you in fact may miss a lot of the best light overall so that could certainly be a little bit of a challenge when it comes to traveling via cruise ship but i did not regret the missed opportunity you might say of not having a tripod and part of that is that in those situations where i wanted to try to get some slightly longer exposures for example i realized that there were alternatives so in some cases trying to get a little bit of a long exposure of waves crashing against a cliff wall for example there was a railing there that I could lean to and get some support from. And there's other alternatives to tripods as well, 
one of which I was able to make use of significantly. So yes, you could lean against a railing, but it's a lot easier, a lot better if you're leaning against a railing with a little bit more support. And so I used a beanbag. This happens to be the Red Pod beanbag. And one of the things I like about it is that it includes a camera mount. It actually screws into the camera itself, just like a plate for a ball head for a tripod would. And so I was using the Red Pod. You can find more information about it at timgray.me slash red pod. And there's also a green model. So this one has the mounting screw at the center of the beanbag, which I found worked best for me overall. The green one, it is offset. It's not centered, it's off toward the edge of the beanbag essentially, so that it gives a little bit more support for larger lens setups. For me, I found that the centered mount worked pretty well in terms of being able to kind of shimmy the camera around at different angles. But the point is that that beanbag support could give you a little bit of additional help including for a scenario where I theoretically really wanted to have a tripod photographing that total lunar eclipse at night. Now, of course, with the moon, you don't want an especially long exposure anyway, because there'll be some potential for motion blur. In this case, I was using the lens all the way at its maximum focal length of 400 millimeters. The lens aperture was wide open, which in this case at 400 millimeters, that meant an aperture of f5.6. I cranked up the ISO to 6,400 and was able to get a shutter speed of one-tenth of a second. And so I was using that beanbag on the railing, obviously the shot here shown during daylight hours, but imagine the exact same setup, but at night in order to photograph that total lunar eclipse. So it worked out actually very well. I wouldn't have wanted much of a longer exposure in any event because I was photographing the moon. I would have liked to have had a tripod in this case. I should mention, by the way, that that was from the ship itself while it was docked, so reasonably stable, but still the risk of some degree of movement. And so not an ideal setup to be sure, but also considering that I had so many different photographic opportunities, this was just one of them. There weren't all that many situations where I would have wanted a tripod, wanted to make sure that I had a tripod, and I was able to make do reasonably well, even in those situations where a tripod would have otherwise been very helpful. I also learned that traveling light can be a little bit of a compromise. So I mentioned in the previous example, the lack of a tripod. I certainly at times would have liked to have had a tripod, but I suppose I could say that I liked even more not carrying a tripod around all over the place. So I never really felt that traveling without a, light, a tripod or the other decisions that I made, I never felt that it made the photography experience difficult, unlike how it would have been difficult to climb all of these stairs. Here, There's Jacob's Ladder in St. Helena, happens to be the island where Napoleon was exiled. I did not, under full disclosure, I did not climb these stairs, but I did go down all of the stairs. Uh, but in any event, I did find there were some minor compromises, but really most of the issues that I might have otherwise run into, at least on this trip, weren't really a compromise much at all. And especially having an all-in-one lens that gives me tremendous range in terms of focal length, that really helped to minimize the compromise because I wasn't really compromising when it came to focal lengths, when it came to the flexibility of being able to compose a scene in a particular way. And so, for example, in Mauritius, this is the Chamarel waterfall, and there is a platform. There's really not too many areas that you can get to to view this waterfall, at least not that are reasonably accessible, but there is a viewing platform. And so that's your essentially one spot. You've got one little area where you can compose your scenes, and you might want to compose in different ways. And of course, focal length enables you to do that, being able to adjust the zoom setting for the camera. And so this shot, for example, happens to be at 53 millimeters, so just a little bit zoomed in. But then I was able to compose different framing of the same scene. So here, for example, zooming in to what turned out to be 89 millimeters focal length, and noticing there was a little bit of rainbow forming in the mist of the waterfall. And so zooming in a bit further to, in this case, 177 millimeters to kind of emphasize that, well, that's only 177 millimeters. And the lens I was using enables me to go all the way to 400 millimeters. So I zoomed in closer still 
This happens to be at 355 millimeters, zooming in on detail of the waterfall and the rainbow that was forming in the mist there. And so again, that all-in-one lens giving me considerable flexibility in terms of focal length range. And I will say, by the way, that I was getting sharp photos as well. I didn't feel that I was compromising at all in terms of image quality. I'm sure if we did a side-by-side -side comparison to some of the top-end prime lenses, there certainly would be a difference, but I was very happy with the quality of the images that I was getting during the trip. And there's another benefit to that all-in-one lens. Obviously, it's given me a lot of benefit in terms of the overall focal length range that I had at my disposal, but another significant benefit that I realized over time during this trip was that by not changing lenses, I was not getting sensor dust. And so, I was really happy about that. I didn't really think about this till partway through the trip. Some of the destinations we were out in the, you know, the sand dunes and whatnot, and I realized this would not be a very good place to be changing lenses. And so I was very grateful to not have to change lenses during the trip to avoid dust and just the inconvenience of having to switch. A couple of uh, follow-up questions here, by the way, that we've got from a couple of attendees. Uh, so first and foremost, did I only bring one camera body? Uh, and the answer actually is yes. I know taking a certain amount of risk that something would go wrong with that camera, but I did bring just the one camera body. I figured that I was only having one lens, so having just one camera body, not you know, completely crazy. Plus, there were a variety of stops along the way where I could have gotten the camera replaced or repaired as needed. Uh, and then Jan was asking what specific APS-C camera. In this case, it was the Canon 7D Mark II. And so that was the single camera. So Canon 7D Mark II combined with that Tamron 18 to 400 millimeter lens. Uh, great question also from Michelle. So the night shots where I'm using that beanbag, was I using a cable release or any other setup? And in that case, actually what I did what I very often do in lieu of a cable release is to use a two-second timer. So obviously in situations where the timing is especially important and I want to make sure that I'm timing my exposure precisely, then I would use a cable release. But in situations where the timing is not critical, then I'll just use a two-second timer so that when I press the shutter release, it's not actually taking the picture, it's starting the timer, and two seconds later the photo is captured. All right, moving right along, I also learned the bouncing around makes autofocus difficult. So we were on a tender. In some cases, the ship would be at anchor and you would take smaller boats to shore. And that was the case here, an atoll that is part of the island nation of Kiribati out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So this tiny little place and the seas were a little bit rough. And so I'm bouncing all around and trying to get this photo. I got the photo and I was really happy. I thought this was a nice tropical scene and then later, I realized it was not in focus. Well, actually, it was in focus. The lens did its job perfectly fine. The camera did its job perfectly fine. The photographer, on the other hand, didn't happen to get the shot perfect because, as I later realized, in this case, the autofocus was tracking the water in the foreground. So as I'm bouncing around, trying to get my shots, trying to frame up the shots on this boat that's moving rather abruptly, the focus was on the water in the foreground. And if you zoom in close on the trees, you'll see that they're not actually sharp. That was a major disappointment. I wish I had realized it sooner. I could have gotten another photo. I actually took quite a few photos, some of which were wildly misaligned in terms of the composition I was looking for just because, of, you know, as I was going to take the picture, I would bounce around some more. So that was a little bit of a challenge, but that had nothing to do with my setup. It was just the fact that I was on a boat that was bouncing around on the waves and I didn't realize I was essentially focusing in the wrong place. And speaking of focusing, sort of, I also learned along the way that you know your focus doesn't always need to be photography. Obviously, most of the stops along the way, in many cases, I was enthusiastic about getting out there and capturing photos, but there are also situations where I decided, you know, I'm just gonna relax today. I'm just gonna go get some lunch, maybe walk around town and not worry about photography, or at least not make photography the focus of the day necessarily. Of course, I still carried my camera with me. So in Santa Cruz de la Palma and the Canary Islands, for example, we decided to just have a relaxing day, just get lunch. The weather wasn't all that great. It was threatening to rain. 
but then I saw a door that I really liked and I couldn't help myself. I pulled the camera out of my bag and captured a photo. And you know, it's interesting too, I know many of you are aware that most of my photography, when people ask what I photograph, you know, the easy answer is sort of travel photography. Even if it's nature photography, it's while I'm traveling away from home. And so, you know, most of my photography occurs when I'm traveling. But the other way I often describe my photography is that I essentially photograph more or less everything except people. And I just have never been an avid people photographer. They've never been the subjects that I found I most interested, I was most interested in photographing. And so if I wanted to photograph people, it would very often be something like this, where I would photograph the detail of what they were doing. I would avoid including their faces in the frame. And I might, you know, have photos where there were people, but they've got their backs to me, so I'm not seeing them. And sometimes that doesn't really work all that well. I'm going so far out of my way to make sure that the people are not identifiable that I'm sort of not making a good photo either. I mean, certainly in some cases, there would be situations where not having the person's face in the frame was more interesting. I think in this case, for example, these police officers in Kiribati, I think it's more interesting because they've got their backs to us. They're looking off, you know, whatever it is they want to protect this little atoll in the middle of nowhere from. But in some cases, that was sort of maybe more of an excuse. To be sure, some of my favorite people photos that I captured, you don't see the face, and I think it actually works. So here, I think this photo of this woman actually is more interesting because we're not seeing her face rather than, you know, less interesting by virtue of not seeing her face. Or here at Lake Retpa in uh, near Dakar, anyway, in Senegal, this is, I think, a very interesting scene. It's one of my favorite photos from the entire trip, actually. And I don't think it's a problem at all that the person is not identifiable. But I realized, of course, that there were many interesting people along this journey. And so I made a point of making sure that I was actually intentionally photographing people, that I was making a conscious effort to include people in my photographs or to make the people the key subject, always, of course, with their permission to take a photo. And I found actually that it, it was fun. I was enjoying the interactions with the people as well as the photography of the people. And of course, saw many great, wonderful faces. I was rewarded with many smiles along the way. And so it was, I think, a lot of fun. I found that it was very enjoyable changing things up a little bit, focusing on subjects, people in this case, that I don't normally focus on. And I really enjoyed it. So I certainly intend to do more people photography moving forward. I'll never be, I don't think, a portrait photographer, for example, but I certainly, during my travels, will include interesting people in the frames. So I mentioned the cruise, in this case, our travels taking us to a wide variety of different destinations, again, across three oceans, a variety of different countries, multiple continents. And so one of the things that I learned, that I have learned about cruising when I'm teaching on board a cruise ship is that it's like a tasting menu for travel. As I mentioned, we're never in port for very long. Typically, it's you know somewhere around eight in the morning until somewhere around six o'clock or so at night. Every now and then there might be an overnight in port. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have, for example, several overnights in Cape Town, South Africa, which gave us a lot of great opportunities there. But it gives me a good sample. While I'm not spending much time in any one location, I'm getting a good sense of a variety of different places. I'm seeing a lot more places than I otherwise might have. And along the way, I've certainly learned that some of the places definitely require a return visit. In other words, some of the areas that we visited, I enjoyed so much that I absolutely want to go back. And so for example, Namibia, it was, we saw just the tip of the iceberg, or I should say, just the tip of the sand dune. Uh, essentially being able to see just a few highlights. I mentioned Coleman's Cop, that ghost town, which was absolutely fascinating. We were able to visit some of the sand dunes in the Namib Desert, and it was absolutely incredible, including climbing to the tallest sand dune, Dune 7, the tallest sand dune in Namibia. Absolutely incredible. I definitely want to go back to Namibia and explore a little further, hopefully go on some safaris there and explore some of the other photographic possibilities. Some of the spots that we missed, such as some of the highlights really in the Sosafle Dunes, for example. So certainly 
along the way, as part of this journey on a cruise ship, I would start to realize that some of these places that I might not have otherwise visited if I didn't have this opportunity, and then I got to know them a little bit and really want to go back because I found that the photographic opportunities I was able to find were quite incredible. But of course, I also learned that not every location is going to inspire. You know, in some places, for example, one stop in particular, the key highlight was a market, which was certainly interesting. I love visiting local markets and photographing there, but I don't feel that I need to return to that destination necessarily. So not every location is going to inspire. But my feeling still is it's always interesting, even if it doesn't inspire you, even if it doesn't enable you to get incredible photographs or at least photographs that suit your particular style. It's always interesting to visit these locations. I don't necessarily need to go back, though, from the standpoint of photography. So some destinations I cannot wait to go back to and other destinations I don't feel that I would necessarily need to. And I think traveling by ship where you're able to see a relatively large number of different locations in a relatively short period of time is a great way to get a better sense of these various types of locations. I also found that friends really enhance an experience. So in some cases that meant sharing experiences with people that you know, so grouping up together with others on the ship to go out on a whale watching adventure, for example, it was more fun because we had others to share that experience with. But also along the way, I found that making friends essentially. So I've talked in the past about leading with experience. In other words, that you try to focus on having a great experience and that experience, that great experience, will then lead to photographs. And they'll lead to photographs that you cherish more because of that experience. So, for example, I met in Mozambique a gentleman who was carving little wood carvings, some of which I bought as souvenirs. And it was great fun chatting with him and seeing him work. When we were in Dakar, Senegal, we went for a four-wheel drive trip. And our driver was hilarious and fun didn't speak much English, but helped us have a remarkable experience as we were touring around areas near Lake Rekba, uh, outside of Dakar in Senegal. Sometimes the friends you meet aren't even necessarily people, <laughs> like this adorable little dog that we met in Cape Verde. This actually, as it turned out, so there was somebody else as we were hiking up this path and stairs and whatnot, up toward a lighthouse because we were told the views from up there were very good. There was also a gentleman with his son and a dog who were similarly heading up toward the lighthouse. And so I had the opportunity to photograph the dog. What I didn't realize until we were all the way up at the top at the lighthouse was that the gentleman was the lighthouse keeper. And so fortunately, we were with someone who spoke Portuguese. I did not. And they were able to discuss the notion of going up into the lighthouse itself. So I was able to climb into the top up to the light of the lighthouse for an even higher view of the surrounding terrain. Of course, that didn't exactly lead to any good photographs because as you can probably see in this photo, the windows were quite dirty with, you know, from the salty air, the residue on the windows made for not very clear glass, but it was enjoyable to be able to have that sort of more local experience engaging with a local and having special opportunities essentially as part of that experience. And so I really did find that having friends or making friends along the way was uh, a more enjoyable part. It helped to make the experience more interesting, more enjoyable, and that I was able then to get more photographic opportunities and just have better memories, which of course led to interesting photos and, and causes me to enjoy that experience and I actually cherish the photos all that much more. Uh, great, Manny asks a real good question actually. I'm not indicating, I haven't really indicated specifically whether or not I'm using the vibration control, the stabilization feature for the shots and if there are any negatives. And in this case, no, I, I absolutely was using the vibration control feature essentially full time for every shot. And I did find that it was helpful. There was no negative consequences. Um, Conceptually, I would want to turn that off if I was on a tripod, but as we know, I didn't use a tripod once at all on this entire trip. Um, and yeah, Kimberly asked if I just got a verbal okay versus in writing. And yeah, in this case, it was just verbally uh, an okay permission from the people to take their photos. Um, and do I, am I doing focus stacking? And, and no, I 
actually on this entire trip didn't do any focus stacking, um, uh, photo stacking at all. I assume that refers to focus stacking as opposed to bracketing. The only time I bracket is when I'm creating an HDR typically. If, I'm gonna, if I intend to assemble the photos into a high dynamic range shot after the fact. And then Albert asked if I was shooting in manual aperture priority or shutter priority mode, which sort of shooting mode. And for me personally, the vast majority of the time, I tend to use aperture priority mode, and then I'll apply exposure compensation as needed. And partly I just find, as I've discussed in the past, that it suits my way of thinking a little bit more, that I'm thinking essentially about how the camera is going to be tricked by the light, how the meter is going to be tricked. And so, you know, if there's an area that's bright, but it's a very small portion of the frame, then I know the camera might not take that into account. And so I might need a negative exposure compensation, for example. So that's just the way I tend to think about exposure. I tend to use manual exposure mode only when I want to lock in a particular exposure setting where a subject might be moving, for example, let's say a bird in flight, and it's gonna be moving from areas where the backdrop will be bright, such as the sky, to dark, such as a mountain range, but the light on the bird is gonna stay consistent, then I might wanna lock in a manual exposure setting for a situation like that. All right, just a handful of additional lessons that I learned before we wrap up for today. I mentioned that I like to eat when I'm traveling. Well, I also learned along the way that photography does not burn very many calories. And so uh, thankfully walking around town with camera over your shoulder can help to burn a few extra calories. We certainly walked significantly. We would usually walk oh, around about five miles or so per day when we were in port, but I also would sample much of the great food when we were in port. Got some really exceptional meals along the way and a wide variety of different foods, which is one of the things that I really enjoy about traveling. Getting to know the you know, culture a little bit better and you know the, the personal experience, you might say, and what the people's lives are like and what sorts of foods they eat. And then um, to the extent that I'm feeling adventurous, taking part in some of that dining, uh, but it really does add to the experience, which again, I think makes those photos that much more valuable as well, makes me really cherish those photos all the more. And then, you know, another notion, what I assumed was going to be a question that would come up was if I had any regrets about the decisions that I made during this trip in terms of my photo gear, my workflow. So other than eating too many calories on the trip, did I have any, any regrets? Well, I really never felt that I needed a longer lens. Remember that with that crop sensor, I'm getting an effective focal length of 640 millimeters. That's tremendous reach. Would I have liked more? Of course, I would always like to have more. There's always something that I wish we could pull in closer with an even longer and longer and longer lens, uh, especially in situations where you can't simply get closer. You can't just walk closer to the subject. So I never really felt that I needed a longer lens. I didn't feel you know, that I wished, for example, that I had brought uh, my 150 to 600 millimeter lens just to get that extra reach, for example. I felt that that 400 millimeter focal length gave me plenty of range. There were a couple of times where I would have liked a wider field of view. So I'm at a 28.8 millimeter effective focal length for my widest setting, for the shortest focal length on that lens. Again, that's a 18 to 400 millimeter, but I'm on a 1.6X cropping factor camera. And so there were situations where I would have liked to go a little bit wider. So I often, for example, carry a 10 to 24 millimeter lens so that I'm getting an effective 16 millimeter focal length at the wide end. And there were, at Coleman's Cop, for example, I certainly would have made use of an even wider field of view if I had it available. But there were only a handful of those situations. So if Tamron, for example, or another lens maker was to come out with a 10 to 400 millimeter lens <laughs> that gave me even greater range, or maybe a 10 to 600 millimeter lens so that I had that effective 16 millimeter focal length on the wider end. I certainly would have enjoyed having that opportunity, but that's about the only thing. Obviously a tripod in a couple of situations would have proved a little bit helpful, but honestly only a couple of situations where that would have made any difference at all. Again, in large part due to the nature of the trip, because most of the time, by the you know when the sun set, I was already back on board and we had set sail for another destination, and so there wasn't much in the way of night photography that I would have participated in in any event. 
And so looking back on the trip, some of my key takeaways, <clears throat> I found first and foremost that with that single lens, my photographic workflow was remarkably convenient. Photography consisted of taking the lens and the camera out of the bag, turning it on and starting shooting. And adjusting my focal length was a simple matter of zooming. I didn't have to open up my camera bag and change lenses. And I saw, I showed you the, the pictures, the videos of the camera bag that I was using. It's a small camera bag. It's not the most convenient bag when it comes to having to switch lenses. And so I was grateful that you know I had streamlined my workflow in more ways than one. And I've noticed, especially when I'm leading photo workshops at various destinations around the world, I find that very often photographers try to bring almost everything with them, like every lens they own and multiple cameras and a tripod and just all sorts of extra gear. And I find that very often they're so focused on the gear that they miss the shot. They're so busy trying to get a lens out of their bag that they miss you know, some sort of action. And with an all-in-one lens, I never had to change gear. I was basically always ready to get the shot. In other words, I was able to really focus on the photography and be agile enough to make the most of the photographic opportunities that arose. So I actually really enjoyed traveling this way. It made my load a lot lighter. I still maintained flexibility and I was able to get a lot of great photos as I was having some wonderful experiences. And so that might lead to the question, would I do the same thing again? Well, absolutely. In part, if I had the opportunity to teach on a ship again and travel around the world again, I absolutely would take advantage of that opportunity. It was incredible. It was absolutely wonderful having those experiences. But in terms of the same setup, would I use that same setup again? Absolutely, I would. And so, in fact, I was just last month leading a couple of photo workshops out in the Palouse region of Eastern Washington State. And I brought the same lens, that 18 to 400, but I also brought the 10 to 24 for a wider view. And I also brought the 150 to 600 in large part because we generally are able to photograph crop dusters at work and a long lens can be helpful there. And yet I found that the vast majority of the time on these trips, on this trip to the Palouse, that I was only using that 18 to 400. I never needed, not never, but I rarely needed a wider view and I rarely needed a longer view. And so I'm increasingly finding that that range can potentially work as my solitary lens, as the only lens that I use on a trip, as long as there's not some sort of special need. I also brought a lens that opens up to 1.8 f-stop, a wide aperture for narrow depth of field, and then ended up never using it a single time on that particular trip to the Palouse. So I would say that I absolutely would make the same sorts of decisions for the same type of trip, no question at all. Uh, do a uh, good question from Eric. Do I use live view? And I would say not very much. I use live view primarily when I need to set focus, for example, when the camera can't focus very well, then I'll often use live view because I just find that easier. Uh, but in general, I'm not using live view unless I need it for some particular purpose. For most of my photography, I'm just using the viewfinder. Um, and then my class, if I'm using primarily matrix metering or you know evaluative, essentially I am indeed using that matrix metering that's evaluating the overall scene, most of the scene. And I find that that works out very well, again, to my way of thinking. In other words, I'm not spot metering off something and adjusting accordingly. Instead, I'm trying to figure out how the, the metering in the camera is going to be fooled, essentially, by the lighting situation. Um, and Ron asks if I'm always shooting raw. And yes, for my still photography, I'm always shooting in the camera's raw capture mode. And then filters, great question, Glenda. I, in this case, did not use many filters. So typically the only filters that I carry with me would be a solid neutral density filter, which I did not use because I did not have a tripod. And so that there weren't that many situations where I needed a longer exposure that it would call for that neutral density lens. But that's one that I typically carry. And the other is a polarizing filter which I would use occasionally. There certainly would be situations where I want to cut back on reflections, for example, but that would be about it. And so, yeah, somebody mentions here that a friend told them that the 18 to 300 millimeter lens is better than 18 to 400 since the 400 range, that longer range, you might get uh, softer shots. Uh, and I would say certainly different lenses are going to give you different performance. 
So to me, the question is not, is this lens sharper than that lens, and therefore I'm gonna use this lens instead of that lens. First off, you need to think obviously about the focal length range that you want to have available, and then the degree of acceptable sharpness. In other words, I could have gone with a 50 millimeter prime lens, and I'm sure that would have given me sharper photos. But I would say that my photos were coming away perfectly sharp. I was not disappointed at all with the sharpness I was getting. The only time I was is when I got the focus in the wrong place or I didn't get focused at all or what have you. Um, so yeah, I would say that wasn't really, I didn't find that to be an issue at all. Um, Albert asks if a camera with a higher ISO capability be more useful Yes, and I should hasten to point out, it's not that the camera that I was using, which again was a Canon 7D Mark II, it does go higher. I, use, I mentioned 6400 ISO for that lunar eclipse shot. It goes higher, but I find the 7D Mark II to be a bit noisy. And even 6400, I tend to find the noise to be pushing your luck quite a bit. Much of it can be mitigated in post, but it's still far from ideal. So yes, I would prefer to use a camera that is actually going to give me better noise performance and at some point soon i'll figure out what i'm going to do about replacing that camera i keep hoping they'll come out with a mark three and i know there's rumors on both sides as to whether that's ever even possible uh, i should mention by the way the primary reason i chose that camera when i originally did is that it was the first slr from canon that had gps built in and that to me because of all my travels is a tremendously helpful feature uh, Janie asked if I missed having a, a essentially a faster lens, like an f2.8 lens, uh, especially when we were in darker places. And I would say there were situations where I would have liked a faster lens. Um, I, really, the only scenario wasn't so much about the dark scenarios because that worked out pretty well. And once it's dark enough that autofocus performance starts to degrade, I usually am switching to manual focus in any event. But there were some birds in flight and in fact, flying fish in flight that I was trying to focus on. And I'm sure that experience would have been improved. The focusing speed would have been improved if I had a lens that opened up to a wider aperture. So certainly something that would have been helpful in some respects. I didn't need it necessarily for narrower depth of the field, but to improve autofocus performance, certainly a wider aperture can be helpful. But again, that depends on what you're focusing on. If you're photographing a lot of action under low lighting conditions, you know, birds in flight and those sorts of things, that would be more important. In my case, it wasn't really a consideration because of the type of photography that I typically do, and especially the type of photography that I would have the opportunity to do on this particular trip. I also learned again, I, I essentially, I guess you could say it was confirmed that variety really is the spice of life. And especially photographically, I found being able to visit a wide variety of very different, extremely different places and see various different cultures and different photographic subjects, it was absolutely fascinating. I felt very privileged to be able to take this trip and to be able to capture photographs along the way. It was just absolutely remarkable. And I also found that it led to a lot of memories. And I found my travels in general lead to a lot of memories. And in particular, this trip taught me, which is essentially a lesson I've learned in the past as well, but that my best memories can be found on a map, which is to say that my best memories often relate to experiences that are had in places and often places far from home. And I really do feel that travel can enhance your perspective on the world, it can really improve your life, and as a photographer, it certainly leads to wonderful experiences in general and photographic experiences in particular. So it was a memorable trip and a wonderful trip and one that I think really was in large part made possible in terms of the photographic workflow and my overall experience because I had such a streamlined workflow with just that single lens. So a journey that once again took me all the way around the world, having incredible experiences, capturing photos that I cherish with a single lens all the way around the world. Well, thank you very much for joining today. I want to once again thank Tamron for sponsoring today's presentation and for making that great lens that made my trip so much easier in terms of being able to travel great distance, to a variety of locations and capture great photographs along the way with that all-in-one lens. And just as a reminder, 
that workflow actually, we've got a new course coming out in about another week that features my overall workflow, including techniques related to that red color label trick that I've mentioned that really has improved my workflow overall. And that and all the other courses that are included in the Gray Learning Library, more than 100 hours of content with more being added on a regular basis, including new lessons every week on Lightroom, on Photoshop, on Photo Gear, and on photography in general. And you can get $50 off the full bundle by using webinar as your coupon code. Or there's a link here, timgray.me slash graybundle99, and that will get you the discount built in automatically. So again, thanks to Tamron for sponsoring the Gray Learning webinar series. Thanks to all of you for joining me today. It's been great fun sharing my experiences from this incredible journey, and I hope you find that helpful and interesting in your own photography as well. Thank you very much.